Welcome to the Outer Realm with Michelle DeRoche and Amelia Passano. Airing live on the United Public Radio Network, 105.3 FM in New Orleans. Hey, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Wednesday night segment of The Outer Realm. We are broadcasting live on United Public Radio Network, UFO Paranormal Radio Network, 105.3 from the Gulf Coast and 107.7 from the beautiful city of New Orleans. We are fully sponsored by the amazing people over at Folgers Coffee, who have been a part of our journey for the last I'd say four or so years, three years. So big thank you to Folgers. We couldn't and wouldn't do it without you. Also, thank you to Dr. Snick, the sonic surgeon, a.k.a. Justin Snicker, for the contribution of his time, his music, and his intro or voice for the intro that you just heard. A little tongue-tied tonight. It's been one of those days. <laughs> anyway, also, <clears throat> big thank you to Steve McGinnis, the artist behind all of our banners here at the show all of our logos so we appreciate them very much find them on facebook and instagram tonight we welcome uh the return of mark de Wizziak, who is he's a, a repeat guest you guys will remember him from the edgar Allan poe show that we did if you haven't seen it shame on you <laughs> go find it on our archives please as it was really a fabulous show and tonight we're going to be talking about vampires and dracula and his book the bedside bathtub and armchair companion to dracula see right there i love it <laughs> it's because it covers every base <laughs> anyway um as you know guys we are on eight platforms we have seven chat rooms roku tv does not have a chat room at all so Bear in mind, it's like an eight-lane highway or seven-lane highway coming down to one lane for communication. So we will get to you as we can, and I'll periodically put up some comments and just so, you know, everybody can see them. Um, also, remember, we do have a lot of audio guests, majority of, so we have to try to uh, keep up and make sure that they are kept in a loop as well. So without further ado our guest for the evening. Hi. Hi, Michelle. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Long time. <laughs> right. <laughs> no kidding. <laughs> well, Happy New Year and all that jazz. <laughs> Thank you. Welcome. Welcome back to the bell tower here. So, uh, <laughs> Right, right. <laughs> so um, how you been keeping? Doing anything well, fun? I'm busy. I've been keeping busy. And then that, that busy is good. I will take busy every time. So you know, this is always good. You know, no, no, I very much is, is the case. And, and I have seen to have no problem keeping busy. So uh, no, busy is good. So they say I'm, I'm the same. Mm -hmm. At least, yep. you know, you're breathing. Well, that and, uh, you know, get you up in the morning, get your heart started and, uh, <laughs> or my me up in the afternoon because I, I, I like uh, the topic that I am a creature of the night. So uh, this is prime time for me. I love it. I love it. Same. I walk around like zombie land <laughs> of the day. But tonight, I mean, we're talking about, you know, vampires mm -hmm. and Dracula and the, the book, of course. So I'm just going to put this up just briefly. Here we go, guys. Mm -hmm. So this is, of course your website <laughs> so i just wanted everybody to see this is your book yep. and it looks so cool like i was saying it's sort of like i love the i love the coffin that's just for the bedside i think it's fantastic i, you know, I, I it was I, part of the series uh, the the book came about because the, the the publisher had done a book uh in the late 80s called the the bedside bath of an armchair companion to agatha christie Ah. It was the best-selling title in the history of the series. Really? And the authors who had done that book then followed it up with a book called The Bedside Bathtub, an armchair companion to Sherlock Holmes. And that did very well. So that gave, gave this publisher, well, we should franchise this out. We should do a whole series of literary companions. 
Right. And um, the editor came to me and he said, uh, how would you like to do Dracula? Because at that point I had done the book on the Night Stalker. Right. Um, I had done uh, a, a book on Richard Matheson's edited a book of Richard Matheson's vampire stories. Right. Um, so I kind of had uh, some vampire credits on my resume. And he said, how about Dracula? I think he was a little upset because I had done several books on Mark Twain. I think he thought I would be upset because he didn't ask me to do the Mark Twain uh, companion. But as it turned out, I much preferred doing the Dracula one. <clears throat> because Mark Twain is a huge subject. These books ran about 90,000 words. Yeah. You can't even begin Mark Twain in 90,000 words. It's too big a life. It's too big a shelf of books. It's too big. But Dracula and Bram Stoker, it's it's a fairly nicely limited universe. Right. And cover, in 90,000 words, I could cover Dracula and all things Dracula and Bram Stoker and his life and such in a, ver in a very good way. So I was very glad to get that book. I was very glad. I'm, and I'm, so I was still tickled the way it came out. And the... Um, the, and the 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 covers always had like bedside. It would have a very Victorian bed, you yes. know, armchair would be. You know, so we had a little fun with the designing of the of the the cover. I I, I love it. I, the, I the mean, coffin where the bed would be. <laughs> I love the coffin. Yeah, you know. So instead of instead of right there on most of the these companions, you would see the very Victorian bed, yes. and. Uh, and it was my daughter's idea at the time, who was only about 10 years old at the time, because I couldn't figure out what to do with bathtub. And she said, well, the first three letters are bat. Put a bat over <laughs> the bat and bat. What a great idea. So <laughs> Leave it to the kids to figure it out. <laughs> that one came, came from my daughter. So <laughs> I love it. Forever, forever in memorial <laughs> to, to her. <laughs> So, um, I mean, obviously fascinating. I mean, I think it was last year. We had the 125th anniversary or the year before that of of Dracula. It's a very old story because um, I know Dacre came on, Dacre Stoker, and, and talked about that. He's a real good friend. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's always been fascinating. I actually think Dracula was the very first book I ever read in my, like, my actual book on my own that I wasn't forced to read in school. Really? How old were you? probably 10 11 that's a, that's early to tackle dracula but oh i loved it yeah i was just a weird kid <laughs> <laughs> not much different as an adult unfortunately but no i loved it <laughs> mm -hmm. so yeah i i enjoyed it i i just you know got my my nose in the book and could not could not put it down well it, it does have that effect on you you know i I, I always say, you know, I, I I was introduced to Dracula as a character the same way most people are introduced to Dracula. And that right. is through the pop culture. I would say, you know, 99% of the people who are introduced to Dracula will be introduced by a movie or, or on television. And uh, it's later you find out that, oh, yes, there was this book that was written where yes. that, that all of this started. Uh, you know, for me, at the age of seven, it was seeing a movie called Abbott and Costello Meet Frankenstein. Right. And it's only the second time that Bela Lugosi played the character of Count Dracula on screen. He played it a lot on stage, of course. But yeah. if people think he did it like 40, 50 times on film. But in truth, he only played that character twice in the original 1931 version of Dracula and then 48, uh, 17 years later in Abbott and Costello Meet Frankenstein. But Lugosi's performance in that film is what really turned me into a horror fan. I yes. fell under the spell of Count Dracula very <laughs> early. And it was really because of Lugosi. Lugosi steals that film. He's really I, I, he did. Horror. I loved him. In some ways, he's yes. better than in the 31 version. In some ways, he's he's in so much more command. Um, he's very suave. He's got a great sense of humor going um, without going over the line. Mm -hmm. And it was just an amazing performance. And and after that, I really, you know, I became a horror fan, but I was always, you know, primarily on the interest in vampire stuff more than anything else. Yes. You know, so, yes. um, you know, I, I was always, you know, a few years later, you know, I, 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 I was seven years old when I, when I said, so that was around say 1963, mm -hmm. you know, and after that I was looking for any, I was scouring the TV listings when the TV listings used to be printed in the, the, the newspaper. Right. You know, every week I would get it and see, is there a horror film on this week? Is there any? So I was looking for anything and I was. It was usually the Friday nights, right? Didn't you have like the. We pole? had two. We had, we had the chiller 
and and we had creature features. Uh, okay. We had, we, had, we had two actually on Friday and Saturday nights in the New York area. Very nice. So, um, yeah, so we so we we did have a regular dose of this. Right. And uh, and I was getting monster magazines and building my Aurora monster models. I still have all thirteen uh, Aurora monster models. I love it. <laughs> right, up, right up here. And, right. You know, any of, if you'll indulge me, can people see me? Can people actually yes, see? Yes, me? yes, right, well, yes. This is worth the trip over here. Then. Okay. <laughs> All right. So this was my very first Aurora monster model. Uh, there it is, the original cast. Wow. The original cast, the Aurora monster model, very first thing. And this Love was my that. First of the thirteen that I got. It's still with me. All thirteen monsters monsters were with me, but this was the one that started it all. I love it. So, you know, there you go. I and love it. So this is one of the, the prides of my collection. I guess. And, uh, <laughs> I guess so. My, my first birthday after I had seen Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein. So right. that's that's right. where that started. And then a little while after, you know, I eventually by by reading Monster Magazines and reading a little bit about this stuff, I, I, I've kind of found out, oh, yeah, there was this guy, Bram Stoker. And he had written this book. And so you got curious, you know. And uh, so raising money legally, the only way a, a kid could raise money legally at, at that point in New York City, uh, New, the New York area, um, with a paper route. Yes. I, there. <laughs> I got enough nickels together to buy uh, two paperback books. I went to Oscar's bookstore. I think I've got them right handy here. I'm going to make another trip over here. So just... So, just talk amongst yourselves for a second. <laughs> I'll see if I can find these. Yeah, they're right here. Right here. Okay. Here we go. These are the exact two paperback books I got that day. Okay, that day. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they cost me a grand sum total of $1.25 for both books. All right? Wow. So I picked up Frankenstein by Mary Shelley. Right. Dracula uh -huh. by Bram Stoker. Now, you know. When I taught my vampire class and I do my talks on vampires, I always bring these with me. Right. And I always ask the same question of the audience. Take a look. Which of these two books do you think I read first? Well, I say I will go with Dracula. Then you would be wrong. Really? The reason, the reason was because, well, look at the covers. Look at the, the, those two covers. The Frankenstein as uh, monster, as depicted, looks a lot like Karloff. He looks a lot like the monster. Look at that vampire. Yes. Yeah, you're right. You're look right. Him. That you know, Dracula doesn't look anything like. <laughs> you know, no, what I later found out is that exactly the way Dracula is described in, in Stoker's book. But he didn't look like Bela Lugosi. He didn't look like John Carradine. He didn't look like Christopher right. Lee. Right. He didn't look like my concept of Dracula. So I kind of thought, well. This guy Stoker doesn't even know what his vampire is supposed to look like. Right. <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm gonna read this one, and but plus, look how colorful that thing is. Yeah, you know? I guess to a kid. Yeah. You know yeah. now now I don't know how many uh, of you have actually read this book. Right. I've read I've read Frankenstein. I'm a big fan oh, I, of, of the. But now, the you know, you're talking about you know an 11 year old or you're, yes you're trying trying to. to try. I could not believe how boring this book was. Right. I'm, I, <laughs> I started to try to read this book, and you know, when the the monster is never called the monster in the book, he's called the creation or the creature mm -hmm. or whatever. And you know, I was used to Karloff. I was used to you know the most the monster ever said was bread, good, fire, bad. That was it. That was the right. whole thing. You know, when this monster started to talk, <laughs> he sounded like a cross between an Oxford professor and a philosophy major. I just I couldn't believe it. Um, Which doesn't fit the bill of a of a brand new creation, so to no, speak. No, 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 no. This is uh, listen to this. This is the creature speaking in Mary Shelley's book to uh, Doctor Frankenstein. Okay. My sufferings were augmented also by the oppressive nature of the injustice and ingratitude of their infliction. 10 year 11 year old me had to read that passage like three or four times before I even begun to think I could understand what that meant. Right. And right. that's the way the creature talks throughout the book. Well, I was a very stubborn little kid. 
I, I, and when I started a book, it was it was a point of, of, of pride to finish it. Right. You know, so right. I actually did drag myself through this book, losing flesh at every ter page. And when I finally got through this book, I threw it aside and you're like, oh, man. Now, how eager do you think I was to pick up this book? <laughs> right. <laughs> but curiosity <laughs> finally did get the better of me. And I had an experience probably not unlike your own. Okay. This book. When I opened this book, the, uh, this amazing thing happened. A hand shot out of this book. Mm -hmm. It had a jeweled finger. And it grabbed me by the throat. And it would not let go. This book was giddy up go right from the start. This mm -hmm. book was like the Sherlock Holmes stories that I had read. It had a pace. It, had, it was like an adventure story. Yes. I couldn't believe how much how much better this book was. If you had a, a few a couple of years after that experience, if you had had bet me cash money and said which of the two is the longer book, Frankenstein or Dracula, I would have said, "Oh, Frankenstein's got to be the longer book. Has to be. Took me forever to read that book. And yes. Dracula went by like that. Dracula is three times longer. Yes, it is three times longer. Now, book. let me say, when I was in my early twenties, I reread both books, and in all fairness to Mary Shelley, let me say, I could not believe how much this book had improved in 10 years. You know, right <laughs> now, the difference is obviously not in the book. It was in me. I was more ready to tackle this right. book and the themes of this amazing book. Right. But this book was every bit as good as it had been the first time. The only difference was it was a different book in a way. It was just as good. But I started to notice things in the book. Mm -hmm. And 10 years later, I read it again. And that's because. You're a different person every 10 years. Right. You've added to life experiences. Mm -hmm. And Dracula as a as a horror novel, I mean, horror, not, horror is always very metaphoric. It, it, it always is about the big themes. The, the real, mm -hmm. Horror always plays it for real. Right. And it's always about the big, big things that a lot of other genres don't even like to do, to, to talk about. Now, in, in most uh, incarnations of Dracula, Dracula does not cast a reflection in the mirror. That's not always mm -hmm. true, but in most incarnations, he does not. Right. So the challenge of Dracula is always for you to stare into the mirror of Dracula and see what's looking back at you. Mm -hmm. What did you bring to the book? What fears did you bring? What nightmares? What dreams? What hopes? What aspirations? What experiences? If you reread that book every 10 years, it's going to be a different experience because mm -hmm. Bram Stoker came up with the most metaphoric of great metaphoric ideas. In The Vampire, there's a lot of room under that cape for just about anything uh, mm -hmm. that you want to, to, to bring to the mix. And that's the, so, so Dracula is this amazing book. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know that it's ever been topped. I really don't know that it's ever been topped for the sheer power of the metaphor to the point we're still arguing today what it's about. Mm. because you've got two levels. Like what did Bram Stoker mean when he wrote the book? Thank goodness he never told us. Mm -hmm. But then also, um, you know, what, what it means to us personally, what, what, what the book means to us. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one of my favorite uh, horror novels is, uh, and one of my favorite writers is Robert Louis Stevenson's uh, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Great book. Yeah, it is. Great and I was, book. I was many years ago uh, now, I was invited to talk to a, to a high school English class. And I had been told they had just read Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. And so I said to the students, okay, you've just read Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. What is it about? And, you know, high school students, I mean, it's, 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 hands don't go up. You, you know, you have to sort of prod. So, you know, you <laughs> yes. <laughs> Finally, a tentative hand went up. And right. I, and I said, yes. You know, what, what is it about? And a student got up and kind of a hesitating voice said, well, it's about a doctor and he makes a formula and he swallows the formula and this monster comes out and he can't get it. I said, whoa, 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 time, 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 time. I said, you're giving me plot. Mm -hmm. I didn't ask you plot. I said, what is it about? Mm -hmm. What do you think Robert Louis Stevenson was writing about in Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde? Right. Now they're thinking. Now they're really starting thinking. And now a hand goes up and I said, yeah. And they said, I think it's about alcohol. 
I said, well, explain that. Mm -hmm. I said, well, it's it's a liquid. It's a liquid. He, and, and when he drinks this, he, he, he becomes addicted to it. And it, it brings out this, this beast within him that he can't control. Mm -hmm. Very good. I said, that is a very sound metaphoric interpretation of Dr. Mm -hmm. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Right. Somebody else said, well, if it's about alcohol, maybe it's about drugs because he makes the, the thing with drugs. That's what's mm -hmm. that works too. Right. That works too. I said, you know, that some people think that Robert Louis Stevenson is writing about the balance of good and evil in all of us. And what happens if one gets out of whack? That you mm -hmm. need both. Some people think it's about um man's response to God. You know, I I didn't create me. You created me. Why am I to blame for the way I am? I, I get the sense of, of the term me and my shadow. <sighs> well, you know? then I ask the, 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 the big question, which of those is correct? Mm. And they all kind of look and, 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 you know, somebody basically says, you know, all of, all of them, none of them, you're the only one who gets a vote. You're the only one who gets to decide right. what you think it's about. Robert right. Louis Stevenson never told us why he wrote Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. He right. left it up to you. Now, as much as I like Jekyll and Hyde, and as deep as Jekyll and Hyde is, Jekyll and Hyde is a very shallow saucer compared to the ocean that is Dracula. Yes. Dracula metaphorically about what it's about. You can't even, you know, you'd be you'd be done with Jekyll and Hyde in, in no time compared to, to Dracula. And we, like I said, and 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 then once again, I we know how Stoker wrote the book because he left behind very detailed notes about how he wrote it. All those notes are in the Rosenbach Museum in Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. uh, every page of those notes, right, uh, in preparation to write the book, we would have very good account of where his sources were, where he did his research for every level of the book, how he mm -hmm. researched Transylvania and such. What we don't know is why he wrote the book. And, you know, right from the start, there were an amazing number of theories as to what Dracula was about. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, in, in, in Stoker's time, it was seen as, you know, uh, everything from a comment on venereal disease uh, syphilis, mm -hmm. the uh, contamination of the blood, you know, the Brits, no, there was never more snooty people put on the face of the earth than the Victorian Brits. Right, and, right. <laughs> and they were terrified of the bloodline being contaminated, particularly by syphilis. And Dracula well, is a disease. He was sick too as a kid though, right? I mean, sick. he yeah. had childhood, I mean, they had to do he had a mysterious disease. He had a mysterious uh, affliction yeah. that nobody has ever understood. He was bedridden. For right, a, right. For, for a while, right. as a youth. Yes. But but Dracula was even read as a Marxist track at, at its time that, you know, that here is this symbol of nobility, Count Dracula, and he is draining the masses dry. You know? Right. <laughs> but that's the great thing about metaphor. It kind everything kind of works, you mm -hmm. know. So right. Dracula is always because, you know, most horror characters, most monster characters, are limiting. Um, the vampire is is almost unlimited, mm. it, and, and we see that in the number of ways that the vampire character has been interpreted and reinterpreted over the decades. We bend the vampire to our use. Mm -hmm. you know, everybody thinks the vampire shapes us. No, no, no. We shape him, and we always shape him by what we need him to be at certain times. It's right. why Dracula always looks different. Right. Think about it. Think about it. If you think about Sherlock Holmes, if I say Sherlock Holmes, okay, you just got an image in your head. I do. Right. <laughs> you know, an image, and the image is probably kind of say the guy in the deer stalker and the Inverness cape, yes. and the yeah. pipe, you know. And if I showed you that, you'd say, oh, that's Sherlock Holmes. Right. I said Ebenezer Scrooge to you. And I say, you know, an old man bent over with a nightcap and a say, you know, shawl. <laughs> It's Ebenezer Scrooge. And he always kind of looks the same. Mm -hmm. You know, this is kind of our concept and doesn't change. Dracula only changes. He yeah. has no better. Look at just the change from Nosferatu in 1922. Yeah. And the Max Schreck, uh, Graf Orlock character. And yes. just nine years later, how he looks when Lugosi plays him. Right. In 1930. Then jump ahead to how Carradine looks in the 40s. Mm -hmm. Then jump ahead to how Christopher Lee looks in right. the 
50s and go into the 1960s. Then right. look at what Frank Langella looks like in the 1970s. Yes. And then look at Gary Oldman. And I could keep this going. Oh, I know. I know. And then you're He's getting never into like... Look the same. No, looks, it's true. You know, and that's because the times shape the look of that vampire. And right. you can always tell, you know, what's in the vampire storytelling, you can always tell by what's going on in the time. Right. It always right. comes out. It always comes out in the storytelling. Right. You know? So when you read it, did, did weren't you ever curious? Like for me, when I read it, being that weird kid, right off the bat, I wanted to know, you know, at that age, I'm going, hmm, I'm thinking fiction, but I'm thinking that there was more, there was more to it. Maybe it was my intuitive self. Because I'll tell you something, I remember watching on TV. Not long after that, this amazing series with Leonard Nimoy called In Search yeah. Of, yeah, where they know. talked about Vlad Tepish, right? Yeah, I've, and, I've got that, that right here, that, that, that day. Okay, right? <laughs> that did it for me. I knew at that point that, oh my gosh, this is a, was this a real guy? But then my younger age, that age thing going, you know, okay, well, you know, could he have been all these things? No. So trying to separate man from the myth, from the creation. But I don't know. Did you ever, when you first read it, what were your thoughts? Because you weren't far off in that age when you read it either. No, not either. And and I was also prepared, you know, because I Dark Shadows had come along. And oh, so yeah. I, you know, that had also prepared me for this. Yes. Um, you know, when I, as soon as I heard that there was a vampire running loose in daytime television, I had never watched a soap opera. <laughs> I never cared about a soap opera. Oh, my that. grandmother watched soap opera. She watched As the World Turns. I always thought, who watches soap operas? You know, well, I was watching one after because of Dark Shadows. <laughs> That's right, right. <laughs> um, so, I mean, you know, and I always kind of sensed when I read Dracula that there was more, yes. but I wasn't ready to access the more. I read Dracula primarily as a a thrill ride the first time. Right. First time. The second time I read it as a, my uh, somebody in my early 20s, and I started to sense more was going. Each time I reread it as I got older, more and more came through more and more came through but again those changes were in me that, that what's on the page is immutable it, it it doesn't change but you change and i and i you know i always did this experiment with my students who took my vampires in film and television class at kent state right we at first night i always made them do this and i would say okay you everybody does this so you know there's no wrong answer to this there's only one right answer and only you know the answer and this is, so I'm going to ask you, and I said, uh, and, and you have to answer the question and don't lie because mm -hmm. I'll know if you're lying. <laughs> they never challenged me this. How the hell would I know whether they were lying or not? Right. <laughs> and then right. I, I said, okay, take a second, look within yourself. Now, remember, these are 19, 20 year olds we're talking about. Said, what scares you? Mm. We're going to go around the class and everybody's going to give an answer. What scares you? Right. And everybody did. It was, a, it, was an, it was an amazing experiment because you got all kinds of answers. You got common ones mm -hmm. like the dark or heights or drowning or enclosed places. Mm -hmm. You got profound ones like eternity or loneliness or the death of a parent or a loved one. Mm -hmm. You got ones which were just unique. One one student just shuddered a little bit and said octopus. Wow. Well, you can't lie. I mean, the thing about right. it is that the, the, the two most metaphoric ways of we, we tell stories are humor and horror. And they're mm -hmm. twins. They're flip sides of the exact same coin. They even <laughs> look alike. Humor and horror. Two, two syllable words starting in H ending in R. And they're the two things you can't lie to yourself about. You either laugh because something is funny to you or you don't. Mm -hmm. You can't lie about what makes you laugh and you can't right. lie about what makes you scream in terror. Right. So don't, you can't fake those two things. Mm -hmm. And they are the two metaphoric devices we use to deal with difficult subjects. So much of comedy, uh, the vast majority of comedy, it really deals with pain. Of some mm. kind or another. Right. Just listen to any stand up comic, and you will hear a lot of pain behind the, the laughter. And horror, 
like you know the number one thing it deals with is is death Mm -hmm. it's it's the big enchilada that that notion that all of our tickets are stamped all of our time on this this spinning globe is 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 limited we Mm -hmm. one day we all know that this this merry old globe is going to go spinning its way and we ain't going to be here we ain't going to be on, on the planet no more so horror really like i said before plays it for real in mm-hmm. ways that other genres don't. And it's interesting because humor and horror are also the kind of literary genres that tend to get the back of the hand from serious, quote unquote, serious critics. Right. They're the two that kind of get easily dismissed. But among writers, it is accepted that they are the two most difficult forms to write. Mm-hmm. And it's, 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 think about, we've only had a handful of true masters in either form. Mm-hmm true masters you're not wrong yes and you know there's so many few really good masterful heart we're still reading the same ones we still read stoker we still read mary shelley and poe and lovecraft and you know that we we read the canon Mm -hmm. you know and and they become what everything gets measured against so you know they get dismissed they get uh sort of you know uh, it's almost mm-hmm. like somebody once said, when you write humor or horror, it's like eating at the children's table at Thanksgiving. You know, you're relegated. Right. You know. <laughs> it's a good analogy. You know? and, yeah. and there is a certain, you know, truth to that, but it they really are the two most difficult forms. Right. John mm-hmm. D. McDonald, the great mystery writer, made mm-hmm. a great point in the, his, his introduction to Stephen King's first collection of short stories, Night Shift. Mm-hmm. And he wrote the uh, the introduction to that book, and in it he said, you know, that among writers it is acknowledged that the two hardest forms to write are humor and horror, and the reason for that is that in the wrong hands, in incapable hands, mm. the humor becomes horrible and the horror becomes humorous. Now that's a good, really good point, <laughs> and that's yeah. why it is very difficult to master those to those those forms. Mm-hmm. And Dracula may be you know the single most impressive book uh you know and which is interesting because stoker you know if you look at stoker's resume you know first off stoker wasn't even best known as a writer in his in his lifetime he was best known as the manager of the lyceum theater sir henry yes. Irving's theater yes yes so he wasn't even best known as a writer in in his own time and then you know he, there's 18 titles on 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 bram stoker's resume mm-hmm. most people wouldn't be able to tell you another one you know right. now, you know some horror fans come up with lair of the white worm which is a which is a very good one you know or you right. know come up with one of the other ones uh jewel of the seven stars the mummy story mm-hmm. but Dracula is the one that, you know, just all of a sudden shoots up. He, you know, he writes this one book that's bigger than himself. Mm-hmm. You know? and, and considering he'd never been to these places. No. You know, uh, I mean, aside from, aside from Scotland. You yeah, know? he'd been to, 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 to Whitby. He'd been to, yes, you know, yeah. to, and of course he knew London, you know, but where yes. he had not been right. was, and this was, again, his research. He did such good research that you yes. could trace Jonathan Harker's journey you know, across Europe to Transylvania and stay at the same hotels and eat the same meals. <laughs> and it's because, you know, he really did his research. Yes. Now, now there is a debate about, you know, that still rages to this day about how much he actually knew about Vlad the Impaler, you know. It's it's mind-blowing. I mean... We don't know. We, I mean, we know he... he, he he probably came, you know, the, the overstatement is to say that Vlad the Impaler inspired the character in the book because Stoker was working on the book and the story before he knew there was a Vlad the Impaler. So See, I think was... time traveler. <laughs> <That's a slide>. But <laughs> come on, that's just weird. It doesn't really matter because when he does oh, find this, yes. and, and as Elizabeth Miller, the late Elizabeth Miller, who is a fabulous Dracula scholar up in Canada and one of the the great, she wrote a book called Dracula Sense and Sensibility. Elizabeth was absolutely convinced that that, that Stoker knew diddly squat about Vlad the Impaler. That mm-hmm. basically all he found out, you know, in the in the British Museum and such was that there was a a, a nobleman who ruled Wallachia, not Transylvania, but Wallachia to That's the right. south, and that um, he used the name Dracula. 
and uh, and he fought the Turks. I mean, I think that was kind of the extent of what he kind of knew. Mm-hmm. But if that's all he got from Vlad the Impaler, that's a lot. First off, he got the title of his book. Yes. And he got the name of his character. Um, and he got sort of a, a historic background that, that he put, even if he didn't know that much about Vlad. Right. It really does inform the character because Dracula tells Harker early on that the that 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 he's void he is a, a warlord he is a uh that he fought the turks and drove them back uh, mm-hmm. and all that and so you do get this informing the character number one mm-hmm. but even more stoker was a man of the theater right why does he set the book in transylvania why not set it in Wallachia? why not set it to the south you know well, well i think so much of it had to do though even with with Transylvania, you know, his family. Why, why, why said he was, he was born in Transylvania? Yes, but I'm not even sure Stoker knew that. Right. You know? <laughs> so, right. you know, wh- why said it, you know, where historically we know that the historic Dracula ruled a province yeah. in the South? Well, right. because Stoker is a man of the theater. Yeah. What sounds better? Wallachia or Transylvania? Transylvania. <laughs> he knew. He went on sound. And that's why I think he, he got, he probably seized on it when he realized that there was this, 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 this character from the 1400s who used the name Dracula. What a name. I mean, it, it, it is. And you can retrace those steps. I've been to Romania and Transylvania yeah. and, and this, the whole, the whole region and spent quite a bit of time there. And you can literally, you can get all the way to the Borgo Pass, and then you, you do. No and, <laughs> you, you do, and and you feel it. You just, you can just, you know, it, it's a, it's a a mindset thing. But you just, you can. And feel. he did that through books. He did that. You know, I mean, it, it yes. came up at one point that somebody asked them, said, like, how can you describe mm-hmm. Transylvania when you've never been there? And he said, a tree is a tree. You know, and what what he was really saying was, you use your imagination. It's like. You've got two Draculas. You've right. got the historic Dracula, right? You know, Vlad Tepish. And yeah. then you have got this fictional character, somewhat informed by that, but still a fictional character, mm-hmm. the vampire created right. by Bram Stoker. It's the same thing with Transylvania. Right. You've got the real Transylvania, and you've been there. So yes, you know yes. how beautiful it is. Tell beautiful. somebody what does Transylvania mean? What is the translation of Transylvania? <clears throat> The just, land beyond the forest. That's right. Isn't, yes. isn't that beautiful? Isn't it that is. Beautiful? And I've been in the forest. <laughs> yeah. And Transylvania, I mean, parts of Transylvania look like the opening of the sound of music. It looks like, you know, beautiful. The, the, it's one of the last fully forested countries in the world. But if you say Transylvania, the average person, what do they picture? They picture <laughs> moats. And blighted <laughs> landscapes and werewolves it's, and castles. And that's the Transylvania of our imagination. But the culture actually still goes for it. You know, you can go oh, yeah. to Brasov and the, the locals will tell you, if you come here the last night on the full moon, the last night of the month on the full moon, you sit in this courtyard, you watch the wolves, the, the werewolves come down from the mountains. I'm mm-hmm. like, can I want to stay. <laughs> See, this is for real. It's, well, remember, the they are crazy belief that's they, strong. Yeah, they, 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 they <laughs> you know, actually, you know, there aren't a lot of vampire legends that originate in Romania. Uh, right. The Strigoi and some yes. other legends do come out <laughs> of Romania. Yes. But, you know, again, Stoker plants all that in very rich, fertile soil. He he plants all this in Transylvania and the Transylvania of his imagination, which is taken yes. over, which is which is fully taken over. Right. Um, and again, it's because he's a man of the theater. And, w- yeah. and once he comes, like, remember, he was going to call the novel, you know, the undead, and yes. then he was going to call it the dead undead, and then he was going to call it Count Undead. And he went around with a lot of it. We wouldn't be talking about this book if he had ended up with that title. When he found Dracula. He found a name which sounds like a whip crack coming out of the centuries. Dracula, what a great name. And right. he knew it because, again, this was a guy of the theater who knew how yeah. important the sounds are. Now, the, mm-hmm. And I'm absolutely convinced when he found Transylvania, when he found Dracula, when he found all this, he knew mm-hmm. it was gold. He right. absolutely knew this was gold. And right. he had to put all of this into the book. He could have settled for it. Remember, most vampire stories up to that time were set in Austria, mm. including Camilla, 
which is the major literary effort that precedes him. So mm -hmm. Joseph Sheridan Le Fanu sets this in, in Austria, and he was going to originally set the book in Austria. Stokey's right. original plan was to, to, to you know, to, to set the story where, you know, you're thinking this is more of vampire basic ground zero hunting mm -hmm. ground. And then, yeah. you know, all of a sudden he finds Transylvania and he founds, you know, this, this Dracula. So, right. you know, that I think, you know, it has to do with a very theatrical nature is that that Stoker was 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 trained on making theatrical decisions. Mm hmm. And then he does that. He makes very theatrical decisions throughout that book. Right, you know? right. And and, and 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 that's one of the reasons it appe so appeals to you when, when you read it when you're young. Right. Yeah. It's, it's, it's fascinating to me because out of anything he could have written, that's what he chose. And it takes him a long time. You know, mm -hmm. Stoker generally wrote his books fairly quickly. Mm-hmm. Uh, but he spends uh, he spends a long time on this book. It percolates for a long time, and he puts mm -hmm. it away for a while. And he picks it up and he goes back, and um, in doing so, he pours so much into this book. I mean, you know, it's like what we may not know why he wrote the book, but you, you stop and say, "What is Dracula about?" Mm -hmm. And you sort of say, "Well, if you just stick it to the basics, not much, you know. Mm -hmm. it, it it's about death." Because Dracula is the bringer of death. Mm -hmm. And Dracula may end up with your death. But he's also potentially the bringer of eternal life. Mm. So, you know, you start with death and immortality as two of the basics of which the book <laughs> is based on. Oh. <laughs> That's huge. That is just so huge. And then there is everything else that the book is about. So it's about power. Mm-hmm. You know, because Dracula is a creature of an amazing powers, even more than usually he gets. The powers he has in the book usually don't translate to the movie, so people don't know all this. But like the ability to control weather. Yes. You know, that, I mean, that's a great. <laughs> what, that's you know, what JR says. <laughs> where I'm going to be in Northeast Ohio, if they like the ability to control the weather, you know. <laughs> yes. Um, so, I mean, you know, so it's about power, death, immortality. Mm -hmm. What else can we throw in it? Sex? Yeah. And oh. we're still debating what kind of sex because that book, I, I'm amazed. Remember, Britain had censors at the time. You could get, you, you know, you could get censored. You could be arrested. Right. Stop <laughs> that book he gets away with because it's a, it's a monster story and a vampire story because the, people don't see it. But, you mm -hmm. know, I mean, Harker is being, you know, raped by the three vampire women. And he's enjoying it, by the way. Uh, he, yeah. <laughs> he's having a good time. That's it. So, um, you you know, know who? <laughs> what were the suggestions? There's, there's a homoerotic quality to the book. There is an overt, you know, uh, yeah. heterosexual quality. There's, there's a lot of overtones in there. <laughs> sure. There's a point where Dracula attacks Mina in her bed with Harker there. Harker mm -hmm. has been rendered unconscious. <clears throat> there's an exchange of fluids. Where, where Dracula <laughs> opens up the vein in his chest and makes you know Mina drink, yeah. you know you've got a, a so you've got three people in a bed at the same time. <laughs> it's unheard of. <laughs> it's <laughs> it's a I know of, of, the, of the most bizarre. Uh, I know. He you know, definitely was groundbreaking. <laughs> in bed, in, in bed, which is where most people were born and died. You know. Mm -hmm. They're both yeah. so you the symbolism of this, you know, and then when you think, can we get anything more into this story? Right. You 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 have to drag in at some point religion, because Dude, this book is there. with rel religious symbolism yes. and religious references. <clears throat> and what's interesting about that is Stoker <laughs> was Protestant. Stoker was a Church of Ireland. He was raised in the church, which was the Irish equivalent of the Church of England. Right. And, and so these are the people who basically kicked out all of the Catholic, uh, you know, icons and the stained glass and all that. You get rid of all that. Right. There's only really two major Catholic characters in the book. Dracula. Mm -hmm. Because Dracula is Catholic. He might be what we would call a lapsed Catholic today, but he's Catholic. Right, know? right. <laughs> and then there's Van Helsing. Right. The, the, so the, the ultimate symbol of good and the ultimate symbol of evil arise from Europe, Catholic. And they do battle on Protestant ground with all the other characters around them Protestants. Mm. 
Mm-hmm. I mean, Harker even says, you know, in mm-hmm. that amazing scene where he's on his way to the castle and the old woman comes and gives him the rosary and puts it around his neck and says, here, take this for your mother's sake. It will protect you. And it does protect him in the castle. Yes. And he says at first, you know, that, you know, he's Protestant. He's, you know, we, we, at first he's a little, you know, uh, put off by this because this is what we, we don't believe in this. We don't believe in these kind of symbols. And, but he says, you know, he feels a comfort to this. And then later, here comes Van Helsing. He sits them all down, this group of Protestants around a table, and he says to them, all right, you know, this is how we're going to catch the son of a bitch. Let me tell you how we're going to catch him. You know, and they rebel at first. They say, you know, how can we believe you? How can we, you know, how can we believe? And and, and he tells them, you know, we were all going to be armed with crucifixes. We're going to use the, the Holy Eucharist. We're going, you know, <laughs> yeah. and it works. Everything Van Helsing tells them works you, you know at the end of the book you just wonder wh- why don't all the characters convert to catholicism at the end of the book because you know van helsing has told them how to do this it all works right this book could almost be read as as propaganda for the vatican uh, <laughs> when you when you do so that <laughs> oh my goodness so you got religion <laughs> you got all this religious symbolism in this book you got all this sexual uh content in this book you've got mm-hmm. all this stuff about power death immortality Wow, <laughs> you know, it's not a full gambit of what the hell. <laughs> not, but that's what I'm saying. You know, yes. You, compared, Jekyll and Hyde is a very you know little conversation compared to the conversation you're going to have on Dracula. Oh, that's it, how it, the book it is. What I find, I completely agree with you. It, it, it's he got away with things that is just mind blowing. I mean, some people could. We can barely get away with some of it now. It's just with censorship these days. But mm-hmm. what it, what is interesting to me is that he w- he could have had other influences because there was there was a vampire called the Count Saint Germain. Have you ever heard of the Count yeah. Saint Germain? Right. Well, well, he stated this man who'd been around from, since the 1700s. Okay, and he stated on his alleged deathbed that his real name was. Francis Rakowski II, a deposed prince of Transylvania who spent much of his years at Siena University. Um, and if we think about that, there are different areas, you know, of, of literature you can find that show this guy also. People had assumed by his demeanor and everything else that he was Transylvanian. But he ends up in New Orleans, which is why, of course, I had to mention him. But mm-hmm. but right up until the last sightings were like in the 80s. But the point I'm trying to make is being that Brown was in you know, the era of the 1800s, you've got this guy floating around literally France, you know, um, the UK, um, Europe, different parts of Europe. It ends up over here where he disappears from over there, you know, permanently. Why would he not have used that as him as an example? He could have. The thing I mean, fascinating was, stuff. Stoker yeah. was influenced yes. by everything. That yes. Was and that comes out in the book, too. Is right. that Stoker, first off, Stoker lived in a time in Victorian England that the one thing is you could be equally interested in science and the supernatural. Right. Most of the people, you know, some, some of the Nobel Prize winning scientists were members of the the, the, the British Society for, uh, for Spirit, Psychical Research or whatever it was called. And they saw nothing wrong. They saw no conflict in being interested in, uh, in ghost investigations and mm-hmm. investigations on physics. Yeah, they, 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 so, so no, so no, and, yeah. and Stoker was a man who was equally interested in science and the supernatural. We don't right. know whether he was actually a member of the Order of the Golden Dawn or... He was very or, interested in the occult. But he was occult in a win, in window, like, throughout the book. But he was also yeah. interested in, in, in all of the sort of the art. Stoker did an immense amount of research, not only on things like timetables and trains and, mm-hmm. and, and, and where Harker would have gone and when and things like that. He not only did a lot of research on that, he did a tremendous amount of research on all of the two leading antecedents into his books, two lines. One was all of sort of the myths and legends and fables about vampires that existed. Right. And he pulls them all together. You see, before that, vampire literature is all over the map. And and vampire, and written, and and logically so. Right. There are vampire legends. The, The vampire is about the only absolutely universal myth 
right. or legend, if you will, that exists. It's right. everywhere. There is a vampire legend in every culture, in every century, on every continent. Mm -hmm. And they, 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 they differ greatly. A lot mm -hmm. of them, you know, a lot of them had to do with childbirth and death and childbirth. A lot yeah. of, them, you know, a lot of the original vampires are women, you know, the right. original power figures are women. But, you know, you see bits and pieces of what's going to become the vampire in all the different in the in the Asian legends. China is a very rich country for the Shangxi and the, the, the Chinese. Mm -hmm. the folklore. Mm -hmm. Japan has them, you know, um, all, all kind, African countries have them. Uh, Native American cultures have yes. them. ancient cultures have them. Assyrian, Babylonian. It's just it's a very the Greek legends. There's all of these and they all have bits and pieces. But with every bit of information like that, I mean, they're out there. It comes from somewhere, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. Oh, yes. oh well, and, and and in each culture, it's because, you know, you have to say, how do we use, how did ancient people use myth, legend, and folklore? Yeah. They were trying to explain the world around them. Yes. You know, it's, it's, not, it's not a lot different than the way we use horror stories today. Right. You know, the, the mountain explodes. Well, the gods must be angry. Uh, mm. There must be an explanation for this. So, you know, a lot of the vampire legends come from people trying to explain why would a young woman die in childbirth? Why would she die at the point of birth and giving birth? That doesn't make any sense. They don't mm -hmm. know about germs. They don't know about infections. So maybe it's a being. Maybe it's a woman who died in childbirth and she's come back to prey on women who are, you know, yeah. you see the, the, the myths and legends coming in. Right. And, and coming together. So that's one thing that Stoker did an immense amount of sort of pulling together all of the myths and legends mm -hmm. and, and basically coming up with the rule book that we're still operating under today, that people make decisions based on what Stoker did. Mm -hmm. And then he studied the literary antecedents you know, from, from Polidari's The Vampire, you know, uh, 1819, 1820. From from for, so from Lord Ruthven in, in, in Polidari's story, on to Varney mm -hmm. the Empire in the 1840s, on to Carmilla. Mm -hmm. exactly 25 years separates each of those stories, by the way. Right. Yeah. And then here comes Dracula in 1897, another 25 years. Right. And Stoker pulled, I mean, he was influenced by all of this, is what I'm saying. So he's influenced right. by all the science and supernatural he's, that's around him. He's influenced by the Victorian society and culture. He's mm -hmm. influenced by all of the literature that went before before him. And then he's mm -hmm. also influenced by all these myths, fables, and legends that he does. Mm -hmm. And he, he pulls all of this together in an amazing way mm -hmm. and decides this is what the vampire is going to be. Mm -hmm. And, you know, up to that point, it hadn't really been pulled all together, you know, the, the way the way that Stoker did. He doesn't get all of it. You know, actually, Nosferatu adds the last element. Right. <laughs> because sunlight is not fatal to a vampire in Stoker's book. You know, that's... That's true. Yeah, yeah, we see that more now. I think Dracula well. gets up at noon and takes a walk through 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 London in in, in the middle of the book, and they, people kind of forget that. And, it's you know. true, but you saw it in Bram Stoker's version, uh, yeah. like the right. Dracula movie. Right. They, they actually, that. I found that was a little bit more true to the book in some ways than some ways. But yeah, it, it but I mean, you see that that's a minute thing in the book, but yet you see it. You know, I, I was sort of happy that they presented it. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know. It puts things that never had been done in it, and you know, and it, re it rescues the character of Quincy Morris. That doesn't do much with him, but what a great character Quincy, an American Texan, strolling through yeah. that book with a with a Bowie it's knife, true. And a pistol. Yeah. I mean, a great character, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, almost no version uses Quincy Morris. You know, See? but uh, but but Stoker, I mean, he 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 really that's that's one one of the things that's the most amazing about that book is. You know, and, and Nosferatu as the sunlight fatal to a vampire, which which it has never been before in any myth or legend. Right. And it very quickly becomes a universal part. After 1922, right. a single ray of sunlight will destroy a vampire. Well, that was never true before. No. And that all comes out of Nosferatu, uh, the first film storytelling of Dracula. And it's it, it's so metaphorically true that mm -hmm. if you're a vampire, you're cut off by the daylight. That is such a good idea. Right. That it immediately becomes part of every, you know, later. I mean, th th somebody like Anne Rice, you know, she rejects the idea that crucifixes and holy objects repel the vampire. She rejects the idea of shape shifting, that they can shift into mm -hmm. bats and such. She rejects mm -hmm. the idea that they can't look at themselves in the mirror, but she keeps the sunlight. 
Right. You know, is sunlight fatal to a vampire in Anne Rice's world? Oh, yeah. Are there fatal right. vampires in Charlene Harris's and True Blood? Oh, yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah. yeah. Like, that was, yeah, you know, that was good. Sunlight is just such a good idea that right. it becomes a, an essential part of the vampire lore and legend. And that's because it's metaphorically perfect. Right. Well, there's a bit of a question here for you. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of comments, but here's a question. Hi, Wayne. Mark, do you think that Stoker set such a foundation that there's no room for anything new because the publishers and filmmakers want every new piece to be a reflection of what Stoker did? I mean, let's face it. This is like still going strong. <laughs> the whole, the whole it you is. know. It is. Now, now yeah. actually, the, 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 the major change in, in vampire storytelling does not occur because you're right. All decisions are made in reflection of Stoker. Right. You know, everybody, so even the ones who don't go in Stoker's way are making a conscious decision either to accept or reject what Stoker did. Right. So in one way, yes. But in another way, there is a, a revolutionary moment in vampire storytelling. And it occurs in 1967. And it occurs in daytime television. And that's, you know, it's exactly 70 years after the book is published. When Dark Shadows lets Barnabas Collins out of the coffin. Right. That's not the moment. Because at the moment, Barnabas is just regularly a Dracula ripoff. He's just basically going to be Predator, a vampire, who's going to show up and be the villain. Right. And, you know, uh, Jonathan Frid, who played uh, Barnabas Collins. Yes. He was a Shakespearean trained actor. Mm -hmm. He did not know how to play a vampire. Right. Um, and when he asked, they could nobody could tell him, you know, well, how do you play this? How do you play a vampire? So uh, he did what any good actor does. He created interior motivations for his character, and he started mm -hmm. to play those those characters. Mm -hmm. Jonathan didn't know how to play a vampire, but he did know one thing. He didn't actually knew two things. He knew how long he was going to be on the show because he had a three month contract. Right. And he knew how how it was going to end because they had told him at the end of 90 days, this all ends with a big piece of lumber sticking out of your chest. You know, this right. is how it's going to end. Well, you know, Jonathan starts to play the vulnerability and the, the un discomfort of the vampire. And the writers picked up on that. And then the vampire started to get fan letters from people saying, oh, this is interesting. And he starts to become a very popular character and they start to write to that. And then they come up with the whole idea of the conflicted vampire. And you want to say like, what do you mean a conflicted vampire? Mm -hmm. Up to now, for 70 years, from, from Stoker to, to, to Dark Shadows, the vampire is primarily one thing. He's predator. Mm -hmm. Now, it might be, we, 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 from, from Nosferatu on, we humanize him. Mm -hmm. we, we sensualize him. We make him the seducer. We make him, you know, sexy. Oh. We make him. Here's a sex symbol. Uh, Women love Dracula. An animalistic scary. sexual yeah. uh, that he had. Right. <laughs> he a predator. And even when he kind of flirts with wanting to cure, like a, there's kind of a world where he needs to John Carradine's Dracula. Even when he, he always reverts back to predator. Always. Right. Well, that's a primal urge, right? Right. But but why would he be anything else? Right. I mean, you know, the, 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 that's what the vampire's job is. His job is to hunt and to drink blood. His job is to be a predator. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But he Dark was human Shadows once, right? Thing. I'm sorry. Some, he was human once. So if you, you get those human tendencies, if they're still there, if they're so strong enough. Well, that's the whole idea of the vampire originally is that the human part of you has been killed off. Yes. You know, mm -hmm. now 67, uh, they give a vampire something a vampire has never had before because he has no use for it. They give the Barnabas Collins character a conscience. They actually have him questioning his own nature and battling <laughs> against it and wondering. This is the first vampire who ever did this. Mm -hmm. And it's, this, this was like, and, vamp, and Barnabas goes from being the monster who's going to be killed off in three months to being the hero of the show. Right. He becomes the defender of the family after a while. Right. And then you're going to see this. I mean, this sets the road right to where we're going to get, you know, Forever Night. We're going to get Angel. We're going to get all of these where you have vampires fighting to defend humanity and they're the good guys and they have a conscience and they have they they regret what they've done so you have this 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 moment it's a revolutionary moment and it happens at the height of the 1960s like how does this fit the 1960s what right. was it? the 60s was the era of liberation movements Right. Thing of breaking through is this is the time we had gay liberation, women's lib, black rights, civil rights. 
everybody in the 60s is questioning the, after the repression of the 50s and after the conformity of the 50s we get into the 60s and everything becomes about questioning you know where you are who you are everything gets turned mm -hmm. upside down inside out we've got an anti-war movement mm -hmm. we've got a generation gap we got a british invasion and right. then here comes barnabas and he's nothing less than vampire liberation Right. Basically, you know, sets the vampire free. He's the Emancipation Proclamation for vampires. Barnabas says, you don't have to be trapped in the box anymore. You right. don't have to be just a predator. <laughs> you can have all of these human, you can claim your, reclaim your humanity. You can reclaim your soul. Right. Well, that's a, it was a revolutionary idea in vampire storytelling. And then right. you see it. You see it. You see two lines. Barnabas kind of splits the vampire world. So you have this mm -hmm. one line that goes this way and then another line that says no 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 vampires are mean nasty creatures who smell bad let's go back to the basics they, they don't do. sparkle right right and so this continues to this very day you have this right. kind of two lines of vampires. it's it's it symbolized in 1975 right 1975 stephen king who is very much on the the vampires are mean side of things right <laughs> He publishes his second novel, which is called Salem's Lot. And in it, he gives us a very Dracula-like vampire and a very mean vampire. Yes, yes. A few months later, you have two vampire books on the bestseller list at the exact same time. Because a few months later, Anne Rice publishes her first vampire interview with the vampire. And she gives you vampires who are questioning their own, endlessly questioning their own nature. And mm -hmm. endless and humanized. And... So now those two books, you know, as I say, Barnabas splits the world. Those two books symbolize the split. And then you see those two lines and you see it all like in the nineties, you know, yeah. you get yeah. angel, right. you, get, you know, forever night. Right. Um, but, you also get, <laughs> but you also get, but you also get from dusk till dawn. You also get John yes. Carpenter's vampires. You 28 know. days. Right. So, right. You, you, and, and to this day, you still get the mean, nasty vampires, right. and you also get the increasingly humanized vampires. Right. So, you know, the, the it's hard to find an unusual story. Like, I have to say one thing about Wayne, who's in our chat room. Mm -hmm. He restored my my faith in reading fresh, fresh ideas because he's got a series called The Vampire Tales, and there's four books in the series, and they're just unbelievable. You feel like you're there. It's very realistic. There's a blend of everything. You do have some of the toiling, and then you have those who are just really, you know, you have the history, you have everything. It's all historical fiction. And and when you're looking forever after, I mean, I'm sorry, it's hard to beat Dracula. I one one of my my prized possessions is one of the, uh, one of um, the original first editions from from mm -hmm. the year that was published wow. and uh, that thing sits in the safe and that doesn't see the light of day mm -hmm. but it's just like you know you're always on the hunt to get away from the mainstream stuff that they're pumping out well and, you know the, the major change that came in you know after the, the other thing that dark shadows did and right. it doesn't has so much to do with the storytelling as it does the character there you remember how i i was saying that um in a lot of the original myths and legends, the vampires are women. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they were, you know. Right. Now, if that is true, and it is true, why is it that by the time we get to the 1800s and all the vampires that come out, the vast majority of them are men? You know, what happened? What 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 flipped the switch? You know, and the answer is <laughs> the, the middle ages. I know. The answer is the Middle Ages, because at this yes. point in the Middle Ages, men take over everything. They take over the church. They take over yeah. land. Women who could inherit property couldn't. They could inherit titles all of a sudden can't. Yeah. And all of a sudden, so you get to the verse vampire stories uh, around 1820, you know, when Lord Ruthven comes along. Right. And you're going to do uh, 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 who is going to be the figure of oppression? Who is going to be the figure of the, the the person preying on the masses. Well, it's going mm -hmm. to be a white male, right? And it's going to be probably somebody with a title. Remember, you went from Lord Ruthven to mm -hmm. Sir Francis Varney to Count Dracula, right? You went to from three titled vampires, mm -hmm. who are, and then you know all throughout the 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 twentieth century, 
almost all of our vampires are middle-aged white men. Right. You know? And that holds true. That really holds true until around 1970 and the cracks started to occur. And that's, you start to get diversity. You start to got get Vampirella. Out. Yes. You got Vampirella. You got Blade. You got Lily Munster. Sorry. But <laughs> Blackula. You yes, get, you know, you do. You get, yeah. and then later on, you get characters like Celine. Yes. And, you know, you get, yes. and all of a sudden, the vampire doesn't just have to look like a middle aged white man. He can look like, you know, anybody. He can look like you. He can look like me. He can look like yes. you. Or the vampire becomes more reflective of us. Right. You know? Now, that's more or less what, you know, I, I think that's the, the, the biggest change in vampire storytelling is mm -hmm. that, um, you know, as we progress from the 70s to the 80s to the 90s, the vampire character itself became diversified. Right. You know? And and it and again, it was not, it's it's almost hard to find sort of the, the middle-aged white male vampire now. And so <laughs> that's become almost like the, the endangered species, you know. Uh, so I mean, you, you when we went to that spate where the vampires were all of almost teen years when we went from, you know, Buffy into Twilight and Vampire Diaries and uh, True Blood. Right. We had, you know, no, it's yeah, ex exactly, and they all did really well. But but then it, you know it shifts again, and oh, no. um, it, it's because of what's going on in the culture. It always shifts. Queen it of the always, Damned, yep. you know, yep. Vampire Lestat that goes back. Mm -hmm. So but, you know, it's not so much the storytelling, but you know the and the other thing that's entered diversification is that. Like if I had a, a class of 25 students who were taking my vampire class mm -hmm. and I asked them, well, do you guys consume vampire entertainment? And they, most of them said, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And then if you went around the room, mm -hmm. they all had something different. Mm -hmm. no, almost nobody was reading or looking at the same thing. Right. You know, in the beginning, some of them had been reading Twilight in junior high school, in high school. Mm -hmm. Others played, uh, you know, video games like Castlevania. Others had, uh, what's that? I love that. I had to get my Dracula <laughs> fix one way or another. <laughs> That's an reference, I know. But, uh, you know, they, they all had some, some of them were into graphic novels. Some of them were into yeah. to comic books. Some of them were into, yes. into, 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 into YA uh, literature. Some, mm -hmm. And, I, you know, you realize there are vampires for every ages, for mm -hmm. every group for every you know it's it's massive it's like you know the vampire storytelling of the 1950s 60s we all watch the same things mm -hmm. we all got shit so we all watch christopher lee when a new hammer film came that was mm -hmm. what when dark shadows was on oh, and yes. i was watching so we had a we had common reference points mm -hmm. now uh, <laughs> that's odd that is that is completely Heck. You know, even Rocky Horror, like even that was an interesting depiction of, again, the, the vampire coming to the vampire lair, like really out there. But it still has spanned, it has spanned through time and it has holding power. You well, know, you get these, these still one of my favorites as well. Like I just, it was, it did well. Yep. You know, Same I idea. It's another thing, you know, because because I do a lot of uh, I, I do a talk, which I just call the vampire talk, which is sort yeah. of the 14 classes that I did. It's online if anybody wants to track it down. But I took like basically the 14 classes of, of my my course at Kent State. And I condensed it into a 90 minute talk. Right. And, you know, one of the things I would ask the audience is you know, when you got away from the audiences, you know, you, when you got away from school and go get to like a more general audience, you would have an age range that could be anywhere from from, you know, uh, teenagers to seniors. Mm -hmm. so I would ask the question, you know, what was the first vampire you remember? And if the people were of a certain age, they would say Lugosi or they might say Christopher Lee. Yeah. But, yeah. you know. For their children and their grandchildren, actually, the first vampire they actually do remember is either the Count on Sesame Street <laughs> or Count Chocula. <laughs> You're not wrong. <laughs> and that's kind of amazing because we went right. from vampires being these foul, nasty things mm -hmm. of the night, right. these awful things, 
to, to plush toys that we give our children to sleep with and say, here, you know, here's the count from Sesame Street. He'll teach you to count, you know, mm -hmm. here's Count Chocula, you know, highly mm -hmm. sugar-rated cereal, you know, have this. Oh, Halloween costumes. It's right. Just, you know. We, we market it to children. Yeah. We, 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 we market the, basically what is a foul, everything that, that, that you know, that has that this, this foul fetid thing that sleeps in dirt and smells bad. We right. give to our kids, you know, right. now and we market them. And then, of course, we have made them increasingly centralized. We we turned them from being the thing you run away from in fright to the thing you run into its arms uh, in desire. So mm -hmm. that that's quite a turnaround. Mm -hmm. That that is, you know, how we get from that's one of the the, the things I teach in the course, and it's one of the things I do in the talk, which is how did we go from here to there? Well, I just go into Romania itself, and and you know, you have all of the historical. Vlad Dracul, and you see a lot of stuff pertaining to that. But I'll tell you, the majority of the stuff that you purchase is Count Dracula. Of course, you know, and they're it's smart. They totally know marketed. they're, they're yes. marketing both. It's right. You know, they're they're marketing both in, in right. Transylvania and Romania. They yes. are, you know, they know there's, you know, in both in, in doing both. But mm -hmm. you're right. I mean, they they. I mean, you have to remember, Dracula was not translated into Romanian. And actually available why in a wide basis in Romania until pretty late into the 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 twentieth century. Mm -hmm. Interesting, isn't it? Yeah. And then when they did, at first they were a little shocked. They were <laughs> like, because their Dracula is a national hero. That's well, true. They're, oh, they're very they're, revered. They're, you know, a cross between like a cross between Robin Hood and George Washington. It's true. Like, <laughs> it's true. Think, you know. <laughs> This Western culture took that fate and turned him to this like zombie character, you know. Is that they were, oh, yeah. but then you know, they kind of made peace with it, <laughs> right? Right. <laughs> well, that, they're doing okay. I mean, it's definitely um revived the tourist industry oh, yeah. for, for the country, yeah. which is, is great. And people get to go and learn, you know, the real the real information as well. And you have a character who has an international following, you know, you have a character yes. who's, who's you know, he is. You know, there's a somewhat debate as to whether Sherlock Holmes or Count Dracula is the fictional character most portrayed on screen. And, mm -hmm. you know, and I'd say, you know, the, the answer basically is if you limit it to English speaking productions, Sherlock Holmes wins. If you don't limit it to English productions and go international, Dracula wins handily as being the most uh, portrayed character on screen. Why do you think that is? Oh, the, the, the lore of the character is just, you know, Dracula is, is the only major monster who can infiltrate. Mm -hmm. Remember, that's Dracula's goal in the book. It's his stated <clears throat> goal. When Harker goes to the castle and he sees, he, Dracula has all of these reference books about London and England. He's studying it. Mm -hmm. He is, he, he's got that great military mind. He's studying on how to infiltrate and invade. And he makes Harker stay up with him late at night and talk to him. Mm -hmm. And at one point, you know, uh, Dracula says to Harker, you know, uh, you know, I want to be able to, to speak, you know, so well that I can pass, you know, and, and, and Harker's kind of surprised. He says, you speak English very well. And right. Says, no. No, my accent would mark me as a foreigner. Mm -hmm. He's planning. <laughs> you know, he, he's always planning. And that's the amazing thing about the vampire is, you know, if you look at any other major monster character, you know, mm -hmm. if you look at, at, at a werewolf, if you look at a zombie, if you yes. look at a mummy, you cannot invite them to Sunday dinner and sit down with the family. I was just going to say that. Yeah. You see, you have the allure of the vampire in the back of people's minds. I wonder if when they read it, because I sure did when I first read it, and I've read it several times, different stages of my life, and I'm thinking, you know, for example, New Orleans has huge tales of vampires, of eyewitness accounts, who claim that they see these people. And we're not talking just people who live the lifestyle or, or, you know, underground movement, like allegedly real vampires who just disappear and do crazy things. So in the back of, I think, people's minds, they think this is a possibility. Unlike the mummy, as you say, right. or the Frankenstein monster coming through or zombies. Well, I see that on different levels on a daily basis, but I'll leave. That's a whole other show. But 
you know, I think maybe that is a part of it, you think? Oh, I think it's a tremendous part of it because the, the vampire basically looks the most like us. He looks like, and, and is while the vampire, he can, he can be the, 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 the person working in the next cubicle from you. He can be the person right. on sitting on the bus next to you. He can be the right. person that follows you to your car at night. There is a, a tremendously, you know, and then again, the other thing too is just the, the vampire, he also kind of creates this kind of Faustian question in anybody's mind, which is, you know, well, okay, here's the ultimate Faustian question, you know, if you are a vampire, you can potentially be immortal, mm -hmm. you can, you don't grow old, and you can even grow younger as you wish, you can be attractive to anybody you wish to be attractive to and they must be attractive to you mm. you have immense power you have the strength of many men and all of these other powers mm -hmm. all of these things you can mesmerize people you can control people what 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 you know i mean if, if somebody says like you want to take the park you know what what an immense and, and then you know somebody says wow i can have all that and then you stop and say wait 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 wait, wait. there is a catch you know, mm. etches, you will forever be shut off from the sunlight. You have to be a creature of the night. You have to drink blood. You have to be a predator in order to survive. Mm -hmm. Do you take that bargain? Do you take this, 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 this bargain of immortality? And there's a part, I think, in anybody who is tempted, at least by the thought of all that. So I think that's part of it, too, is because the vampire, again, he symbolizes so many things. He does symbolize immortality and death. Well, and if, if you have vampires who are of title, they're assuming mass you mass amass wealth over time and knowledge. And, you know, like I, I know that I think that that that's pretty much what I, was, what I meant when I meant even the vampire lore of New Orleans. There is an underground movement of people who are completely this is their lifestyle mm -hmm. you know but these yeah. these these characters that seem almost subhuman like they just can do all of this incredible stuff like with the count saint germain he was an alchemist yeah and a lot of people believe that he reached and figured out the immortality part of what alchemy has to offer and that's how he got you know that's how his story goes so now you've got people thinking okay well you know what else what else is there and this is a possibility and i think that that is you know, again because everything informs the book everything right. does. you know science informs the book religion yeah. informs the book i think that that's you know and, and again it's always about what you bring to the book if you bring whatever you bring to the book you're going to find it right in the book and i think that that's th this is why i say you know that stoker wrote one book bigger than himself Maybe look. You look at any other major literary figure around Stoker or in the right. night, and you say to you know, well, uh, you know, Charles Dickens, you know, right. Charles, oh, oh, Oliver Twist, David Copperfield, Tale of Two Cities, you know, it, Mark Twain, oh yeah, Life on the Mississippi, Huckleberry Finn, Connecticut Yankee, right. King Arthur's Court, you know, Edgar Allan Poe, The Telltale Heart, The Raven, The Castle, yeah. of you know, you just it's go a gift on. that keeps on giving. <laughs> Right, on Stoker, and you right. say Dracula, and it almost begins and ends the conversation. You Gosh. really don't have a lot of talks about Lair of the White Worm. You don't really, you know. And, and again, he he writes this one book, Bram Stoker. You know, I know, and I always say this in my talks is because I always ask my students and I always ask my audience. I say, you know, the Bram Stoker was not best known as a writer in his lifetime. What was he best known for? Well, then nobody ever knows. So I say, okay, well, he was the manager of the Lyceum Theater. What's the Lyceum Theater? Nobody knows. Okay, the Lyceum Theater is the home theater of Sir Henry Irving. And you can all tell me about Sir Henry Irving. Well, no, they can't. I said, now, just imagine this. Take any five superstar actors right now that you can think of. I don't know who you're going to be thinking of. Everybody has to be something different, you know, you know. But whoever five actors you can think of, who do you think the five biggest actors on the planet right now are? Got them in your mind? All right. Put them all together, multiply them by 10, and you still would not have Sir Henry Irving. Mm. Sir Henry Irving was so big in his lifetime as a acknowledged leading actor in the planet, not just mm. England, but the planet. Right. 
he was Sir Henry Irving, and he was the first actor to be Sir anything. Mm -hmm. He's the first actor, the first member of his profession to go down on one knee in front of a monarch, arise Sir Henry Irving. Mm -hmm. Sir Henry Irving was so big that when he died, the funeral was at Westminster Abbey. Wow. That's the big room. That's right. where they bury the kings and the queens. That's where all the royal weddings and the royal funerals are. It doesn't get any bigger than Westminster Abbey. And that's where the right. funeral was. Right. But, Michelle, if you had attended that funeral in 1907, and you had had the temerity to suggest that 114 years later, there would be a speaker addressing an audience of 100 people in America, and not one would recognize the name Sir Henry Irving. Hmm. You would have been thrown out of that abbey for blasphemy. Right. Not know who Sir Henry, Sir Henry Irving is immortal. Right. But then, had you gone a little bit further and suggested that his manager, Bram Stoker, would be better known than he was. You wouldn't have been thrown out of that abbey. You would have been laughed at. Him. <laughs> mm. Rob Stoker, his manager, is going to be better known than Sir Henry. Is that what you're suggesting? That's going to happen 114 years from now? That's exactly what's going to happen. And the and reason did. it's going to happen is because Bram Stoker gained a level of immortality by writing about a potentially immortal creature. Mm -hmm. It has captured our imagination. And like my first encounter, where that hand shot out of that book and took me by the throat, right. will not let go. Dracula right. has still not let go. And right. I think, you know, that's why we're still talking about it. That's why we're still talking about that. Book. It's one of those things that you'll be talking about for it's never. It's one of the things that's never going away. Oh no, no, it's, it's, it's and never going to go. We reinvent him because we need to reinvent him. We need Count Dracula. We need him to be certain things at certain times. So right. I mean, we we need him to be Christopher Lee at some point. We need him to be Franklin Jell at a certain point. We need him to be Gary Oldman, mm -hmm. and we will still keep reinventing him, right? As we do, right? I mean, there's been a lot of. Well, I won't say a lot. There's probably been a handful of movies done on Dracula called Dracula that are leaning more towards the life of Vlad Dracula. Oh, yeah. And yeah. how do you feel about those a comparison? I freaking love them because well, I'll, because I'll... I'm an I'm a history nut and I and I like that connection to the Dracula story. Well, I'll tell you how that happened, and 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 I and I and I do like it too because I I was dear friends with the person who sort of first did it. Okay. Uh, Richard Matheson. Now, Richard Matheson wrote what is arguably the second greatest vampire novel of all time, which is *I Am Legend*, which was done in 1954, and wow. he came up with an entirely different concept of. As a matter of fact, his vampires were more like what became zombies in movies. Oh. And George Romero basically ripped off *I Am Legend*. When he made Night of the Living Dead, and he took right. basically all the conceits of Richard, but Richard was tapped to do the uh, the the TV movie version that Dan Curtis did of Dracula in 1973, thereabouts, right. with Jack Palance as Count Dracula, and this was right. the first one to basically suggest that uh, the fictional Count Dracula and Vlad the Impaler were one and the same person, and the reason was because. A couple years before, the book In Search of Dracula, which was a landmark book by Raymond T. McNally. I owned it and loved it. Yes. Yeah, I sat in first edition. <laughs> yeah. That book yes. put Vlad the Impaler on the map. We went yes. from nobody knowing who Vlad the Impaler was to everybody knowing who Vlad the Impaler Vlad was. was. Yes. So yes. now you have the next major version of Dracula done after yeah. that. by And Richard Matheson writes the screenplay. So he takes all the Vlad the Impaler stuff. Right. Puts it in. He also steals uh, something from Dark Shadows, which is the whole notion that uh, the character of Mina is the reincarnation of Dracula's lost bride. Yes. It's then going to be stolen by 
Francis Ford Coppola and his team right. Right. for uh, their version. I mean, that does not, that's not in the book. That's got nothing to do with the book. That whole no. idea that Mina is the reincarnation of Dracula's. Right. It's just, it, where did they get it from? They got it from the earlier version of Dracula and they got that from Dark Shadows. Right. Uh, so, you know, it, 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 but, you know, um, that starts it. That's the one that starts it. And then the Gary Oldman version really goes whole in, you know, all in right. on the on the whole idea of Vlad the Impaler and Dracula being the same person. Right. Right. So I, yeah. I love that. Mm -hmm. I love that. There, there's been some really um, great um, films that have come out even since then. I mean, some of them are international Okay. films as well I, you know the, the the u.s had a had a couple of good ones but i just i love going back and just seeing something that's a little bit more realistic but yet still keeps the whole dracula theme in place it's you know, just an expansion it, it, you know if you took all of the, those draculas and you made one big collage out of them and had all of the, the various draculas that we're talking about and you know you start with with max shrek and Yes. Uh, Nosferatu, and you work your way through, you know, have all those Draculas. You would just look at all those faces and go, this cannot be the same character. <laughs> <You know? laughs> These people do not look alike. <laughs> uh. These people look radically different, you know, uh, right. and they are radically different. And, uh, and again, that's because our times shape, you know, whatever's mm -hmm. going on in the vampire. Why does Lugosi look the way he does? Why, why, why did we go from the character looking like the, the that that rodent like rat like character in Nosferatu, to because mm -hmm. well first off why does Max Shrek look the way he does? Well, he's pretty well, wiggy. That guy was creepy. Yes, he is. He is very creepy. Now, but it's how's he supposed to be though? Well, it's obvious if you know if you if, again all you have to know is what's going on in the culture and history to know why that vampire looks the way he does. Right. And that is that Bram Stoker dies in 1912. Okay. Mm -hmm. Ten years later, we get Nosferatu, 1922. So what happens between 1912 and 1922? We have the First Great War, which, you know, where we perfect death, you know. And then we also, as the war is winding down, we get a little gift called the Spanish Influenza, right. which kills more people worldwide than the war did. You know? Right. Many, many right. more died. Yeah. So here's Germany on its knees, battered, defeated nation. And out of Germany comes Nosferatu in 1922. F.W. Murnau is fashioning an ultimately hopeful message to his country saying, young people are going to die. And they're going to die to war and pestilence. No, you know, so he sets the, the movie in the 1830s when the last great plague went around. So what did they think? Mm. Carried the plague. Right. Rats. Right. So what does the vampire look like? The rats. vampire looks like a rat, and there are rats all through that. But if you case you missed that, right. there are rats running all the way through that film. And right. so right. he's he's using the vampire as as we come out of the Spanish influenza. He's using the vampire as a symbol of pestilence and plague mm -hmm. and and death. And he ultimately says, you know, but the, even though young people are going to die, we will see a better day. We will see the sun come up. And right. we will see a better day. So that vampire is very much shaped by what's going on. It's a right. sign of the times. Right. But now we go just nine years later, and he looks like Bella Lugosi. Well, so, now you've got and they look like Luke Evans. Right. <laughs> Dracula Untold. But, but, but why does that he was like a great him? movie? Where does Lugosi look out of the book? Because we know what Stoker's vampire looks like, and that don't look like Lugosi, and it doesn't look like Max Shrek. It, it does not, no. So why does he look like? Because right after Nosferatu was released, Florence Stoker, the widow, allowed a producer to create a stage version of Dracula. Right. And in the stage version, the vampire had to enter an English drawing room and not draw attention to himself. Well, right. the, the vampire in the book can't do that, and that character Nosferatu can't do that. Right. So they cleaned him up. And they put him in evening clothes. Right. And very, him, very distinguished. You know. And then by the time it goes to Broadway in 1927, they want him to be the symbol of sexy. And uh, my students have a hard time getting their minds wrapped around this being sexy. Right. <laughs> I know. That the reigning sex symbol of the silent movie era was a guy by the name of Rudolph Valentino. Oh, yes. Who was foreign. 
had long expressive hands and fingers, mm -hmm. flaring eyes, an aquiline nose, slick mm -hmm. back black hair. And then you compare it to Lugosi and you go, oh. I like him. <laughs> <That's> cool. <laughs> He'll do. Yeah. Why? Right. Because he's the symbol of what was sexy at the time. He's the vampire Val as Valentino. Right. So you can do this. I'm, I, just, I just did that with the first two vampires to say this is right. what was happening at the time in the culture. And this is what shaped that vampire. Was, but you can do that for every vampire in every era. Oh, sure. And Rice always had attractive vampires. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, it, it was it was definitely, you know, a, a sign of the times. I like where they go with it now. I like the blend of the fiction with the, the history. I just think it has so much more potential to keep evolving oh, because unfortunately i mean dacre has been great dacre has been involving <laughs> evolving the stories with additional books and mm -hmm. you know keeping keeping it alive as well from the family's perspective which oh, i commend him for but um grateful to the family for even allowing you know with bram's widow even allowing the flexibility for change to veer away from her husband's original writings and his his research and his oh, yeah. vision yeah, because you know the the stage version of dracula was no more faithful to the story than nosferatu had been yeah. <laughs> nosferatu was more the only thing nosferatu was was illegal because yeah. he didn't get permission you know and yeah you know she sued and the judgment at the time was that all copies of Nosferatu were to be destroyed, incinerated. Mm. Wow. That was the judgment of the court. But, you know, yeah. tracking down all the copies of Nosferatu is like tracking down vampires. How do you know when you got the last one? You know, so. I know. I know. It's true. It is very hard. But thankfully, <laughs> that, that didn't work. And we have Nosferatu today to watch. Because it's right. still an amazing movie. Still one of the great. It, 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 was, it was well done for what it was. Mm -hmm. You know, oh. I. I you know, it's, it's still a very creepy movie, you know, even as ancient as it is and as right. simplistic as all of some of the, uh, uh, <laughs> you know, effects that they use, the under cranking of the camera, the going to negative. And, you know, back then, all of the special effects had to be done what was called in camera. There is there is no CGI. There is no, you know, looking at right. so right. everything had to be done. You yeah. know, uh, you know, in camera, and so it's an amazing movie. They did every trick they could right. to to make it work. And uh, well, I, I like this comment from Wayne: the telltale tiny holes for the bite created way back then, so not to frighten the female movie viewers. Whereas with Nosferatu, his fangs look dull. I can't imagine them piercing you. But I mean, realistically, a lot of the vampire movies, probably the newer ones, it isn't just a couple of puncture movies. You just rip your throat open. That's what they did. They were it predators. Is. And then remember that we go through a, a period of time from Lugosi on where they couldn't show fangs. Oh, that's true. I mean, you know, from the uh, yes. until the 1950s that you actually can show uh, fangs. There was a Turkish Dracula movie in the early 50s, which was the first time that Dracula had actual fangs. And then, yeah. you know, Christopher Lee comes along uh, and you get that amazing close up in the first film, you know, right. uh, and right. you see the blood to show. And it's just, I it's got him. Yeah. Um, right. So, right. You know, and that was the first. Then, then you started to get, you know, fangs as a, a basic part of the equipment. But, you know, the sensor wouldn't let you and, and the sensibilities of the time, even though Dracula's pre-code, right. they wouldn't let you uh, they wouldn't let you, Lugosi wear fangs. Right. See, I, I, I love it. It's just one of those things. I'm really glad that we, we actually talked about all of this tonight because for me, it just takes me back to the first time I ever read Dracula and how much I loved it, how many times I've read it since, how many renditions of films that I've seen and different books that I've read would have been embellished and changed a little bit. Um, it still has the same feel for me now as it did when i first picked up that book oh i i think it's it's a like i said it's an amazing book i think you know uh if if somebody said like what do you think the great i wouldn't say that bram stoker was the great horror writer uh, you know he's on the mount rushmore of 19th century horror the, the, to me right. the mount rushmore is mary shelley right oh 
Stevenson and Stoker, and they write the seminal work there because you know yeah. you have three seminal yeah. novels, you know, all coming from writers in England, you know, or the British Isles, I should say. You have Stoker who is Irish, you have Mary Shelley who is English, and you have Stevenson who is Scottish. Right. And they write the three, the the, the, the Jekyll and Hyde, Dracula, and Frankenstein. Right. And then Poe is the short story guy, the guy who writes the modern short story uh, model. And the, so the four of them, and he's the sole American in the group. No. But to me, that's the Mount Rushmore. Um, and with Stoker, like I said, it kind of comes down to one book because I don't think he's quite the writer that the other three are. Right. You know, you wouldn't say, well, how do you, you rate Stoker? But he wrote the best book. <laughs> he did. He did. Stevens is in a day in, day out basis. But what is the best of the novels? What is the best? What well, still might be the best novel? You know? Yes. Yes. Okay. That's where that's it's pretty amazing. It, it's the one story that will continue on, not just in literature itself, but in film and in plays. It's a character that that is he really is timeless. Oh yeah. Oh, He's yeah. immortal. So, you know, yeah. it's funny because when I look at you know Bram writing this this book, when I consider it, I you know, I've often wondered, even upon writing it did he really think it would go to the point of where it is today? He talked about immortality for his character and he achieved it. He does achieve it, but truly yeah. he doesn't live to see it because Dracula really, yes. it's the Lugosi film. It re what really cements it is that 1931, that film is so amazing and it creates really the modern horror film. Yes, uh, you know, got, because it is, it is really the, the the initial one of the boom uh, mm -hmm. for the classic Universal era of, of horror, and mm -hmm. that was when uh, the first sort of classic edition of Dracula, the, the American Library issued it uh, as a classic after Lugosi. Right. So it's really in the 1930s, where Dracula is 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 read as literature for the first time. Right. Up to that point, it had been a play. It had been, you know, it, um, Stoker, you know, when it when after it was published, there were two people who uh, who recognized what he had done. One was his mother. <laughs> now, mothers generally do sort of, you know, of course, <laughs> <laughs> are not always the most reliable of of people when it comes to this sort of stuff. Right. But when you know, Dracula was published. Bram Stoker's mother wrote him a letter where she basically said, Poe is nowhere. Miss Shelley is nowhere. You've done it. You know, uh, she kind of got it. <laughs> she kind of got it. And the other person who recognized it was, of all people, Arthur Conan Doyle. Wow. Doyle, who's, you know, in the middle of, of his Sherlock Holmes popularity at this right. point and, and everything, he writes a letter to to Stoker and says, you know, this is the best horror novel anybody's ever written. He he basically nails it. And he wow. basically tells him so so Doyle got it and Stoker's mother got it, but very few other people did. <laughs> and, and hey uh, man, if your mother gets it, that's all you need. <laughs> no but, bias you know, there. there letters that, that he gets, you know, congratulations when yes. Dracula is published. I mean, it's not like nobody recognized it. it was not like right. it was, but it was not, you know this huge roaring success right that, uh that it could have been it took a while it took, right it, it definitely took a while for it to march to settle on, in yes know, and finally you know and and while stoker was a very good promoter for the lyceum theater and Henry irving he was not a very good self-promoter he was not a very you know he was a very hale hearty guy who was very modest about himself he didn't you know push himself he didn't write about it. He, you know, he writes the two volume uh, memory, memoirs of Sir Henry Irving, which is an amazing thing because he writes the most he writes about himself mm -hmm. is about his experiences with Irving, you know, and other people like Walt Whitman, who he met. You know, right. that's one of the things about Bram Stoker is when you study his life, Bram Stoker seems to have known everybody. For as little as we seem to know about Stoker, right? Because he's a man in the shadows to for to a great extent, and he mm -hmm. and he was not he did not reveal very much in letters or anything. He didn't leave behind diaries or letters. 
he left behind papers and the papers basically tell us how he did things or where he was or what he was right. doing, but they don't reveal much about the man. Right. And, right. Um, but it's still fascinating though, that you can, you can actually read through them that yes. they said they exist. Oh yes. And uh, you, so, you know, you get a sense of the man in some ways, but he doesn't reveal much. And yet he seemed to know and be trusted by a wide, stunning number of people in his time. Mm -hmm. Do you right. know, in his time, in, in, in Stoker's lifetime, he was known and trusted by Walt Whitman and Mark Twain in America, both of them, hmm. brought the world of him. And they left behind, they trusted him. They trusted him with, with their thoughts, their business affairs in some cases. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of amazing just to start to say, well, that's in America. But then you jump hmm. to, you know, England, he knew Oscar Wilde. Right. He knew W.S. Gilbert of Gilbert and Sullivan fame. He knew Winston right. Churchill. He right. knew Theodore Roosevelt. He knew wow. George Bernard Shaw. He, you know, he knew uh, William Gladstone. He knew Lord Tennyson. He knew Doyle. Right. You know, right. he's at the center of, of English society and the English literary and theater scene. And he knows everybody. Right. And he's associated with, and they know him and they like right. him. You know, he's a very well-respected, admired guy in a lot of ways. Very well-rounded. Yeah. yeah. Just, yeah. you know. Well, I am i can't even believe that we're at the top of the hour. Like, we've, we've just like the last time. <laughs> <laughs> it just says, all the time flies by. It's like, oh, come on. Here we are. <laughs> you got, you've, got, you've had me on a couple of favorite topics here. You had me on, uh, you know, Dracula and, and Medgar Allan Poe. That's, you know, you're going you're gonna to get me going, so. I know. I, and I love that. And I appreciate it because they're two of my, you know, favorite uh, authors. And I grew up basically reading their stuff and watching it all on in film and on television. And it's just nice to get, you know, um, feedback from somebody who's researched it and from someone who, who acts it and just understands it so much on different levels, you know, especially from the theater standpoint, because that is, that is a really big part of all of this. And people oh, really don't you know, have you, an idea. You could spend, we could spend 20 minutes just talking about the influence of Shakespeare on Dracula. Oh. <laughs> Stoker knew his, his, his Shakespeare. Right. Now there's a lot of things in Dracula to echo Shakespeare. For instance, the three vampire wives in the castle, obviously echoing the three witches at the beginning of Macbeth. Right. You, know, um, right. you have all these, but even more so, it's amazing if you keep score, how many of the characters in Dracula quote Shakespeare at one time or, or another, including Dracula. <laughs> right. It's true. <laughs> I mean, at one point, Lucy's dying and she compares herself to, to, to a Shakespeare heroine. Uh, right. Everybody's quoting Shakespeare throughout that, that book. Right. You know, it, it's just it's just stagger. <laughs> hey, something for everyone. That's what I say. <laughs> something you know, for everyone. So why don't you tell um tell us what you have coming up and how to find you and so on? Well, right now I'm still, you know, the, the paperback version of the Poe biography comes out in a couple few weeks. So right. uh, you know, the book was just nominated for an Edgar Award by the Mystery Writers of America. So right. uh, you know that 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 uh you know, I, I never expect to win something like that, but it's always right. to be nominated. Right. Uh, it so, is. So, so the Poe book continues. I am working on a revision of my Night Stalker book, which, you know, mm -hmm. is a, one of the great vampire stories, uh, the original Night Stalker, with, mm -hmm. uh, the Carl mm -hmm. Kolshak character, and, yeah. and a nasty vampire, a very mean, nasty vampire. It's a the vampire right. so inhuman, he's not even allowed to speak. In that, mm. just growls and hisses. And I love hear. that. <laughs> right. So, uh, that's my next thing is working on a revision of that book, uh, which was last published in '97. It badly needs an updating and a revision. So, right. that's, that's my next project. And now that I have, uh, you know, uh, that out of the way. But, Very uh, nice. Yeah. Very nice. And they can find you and all of your books at your website, which we yes. have. Which is markthewitbeck.com. It's real tricky. It's my name.com. So, <laughs> <laughs> so drop mark a line, guys. If you want to my, my deeply schizophrenic resume, and uh, right. <laughs> that's a big one. <laughs> well, it, it always confounds people, you know, it always confounds people because you know, there are five books about Mark Twain, right? You know, there's a book about Theodore Roosevelt, there's books of TV history, 
There's a book about Columbo. There's a book of theater history. Right. Uh, there's, you know, a horror novel. There's uh, one on the Twilight Zone, one on the Shawshank Redemption. It goes all over the map. And and I would be the first to, to, to cop to it being a deeply, deeply schizophrenic resume. Uh, yeah. and, and, I, and one of the reasons is because I, I don't like repeating myself. Right. And I like pursuing my interests, you know, you know, so I always sort of seem to get drawn back to, you know, the spooky side of the street. Right. So, you know, there's always kind of a running theme of that. There's one that there's the Twilight Zone and there's Poe and there's Dracula and Night right. Stalker. And right. then I always seem to get drawn back to Mark Twain as well. So there's that humor and horror thing again. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> well, I love that. And I thank you so much for joining me tonight. And Amelia, I mean, one of these days we're going to get her, but she's just, you know, under the weather, just this season. And she was just like, oh, come on. I can't believe I'm down again. <laughs> so we might just have to do this again and maybe we'll be able to wrangle her. But, <laughs> but well, anyway. you know, this year is the 100th anniversary of Rod Serling's birth. So wow. This, you know, we're going, there's going to be a lot of Twilight Zone. This year. Yes, and it's the 175th anniversary of Poe's death this year. So oh, we've got two, right. and uh, and the, and the 30th anniversary of the release of the Shawshank Redemption. Wow, three of my books are kind of. You know, I just have so, to go have a little peruse on the website and maybe do come this up again. Anniversaries this year. You know. Yeah, lots of them. Maybe busy guy for sure. <laughs> yeah, already am because of that. Because you know, getting a lot of Twilight Zone stuff. Yeah. Still a lot of Poe. Yes. Uh, but also, yeah. you know, the uh, uh, the Shawshank Redemption uh, right. anniversary is, is kicking up a lot of interest, too. Yes. Well, I'll most certainly be in touch. <laughs> so <laughs> you'll be hearing from me. Well, you, but, you, know, you know how shy and retiring I am, you know. So it's just. Uh, I, I, I love it. You know, I'm a hard get. You have to ask me. Right. <laughs> No, you're a great guest. I love having you on. It's nice to spend a couple of hours with you. Well, my pleasure, absolutely. And uh, yep, yeah, let's let let's do it again sometime. We shall. I promise. <laughs> all right, Mark. Thank you so very much. Okay. Have a good evening. Good night to all. Good night. Well, everyone, we have come to the end of our segment, and yes. Just a great, great show. I just love this man. He's just wonderful. He's informative and just so full of information. So big thank you to Mark Dewiziak for joining us tonight and talking about Bram Stoker and Dracula and vampires and just film and oh, you name it. He's just a blend of everything. So big thank you to him. Big thank you to Folgers Coffee for sponsoring the show. Big thank you to Justin Snicker and Steve McGinnis. And guys, email for the show is up on the board here. If you want to contact us, please feel free. Tomorrow night, all the way from the UK, and I will be recording this because, you know, it's way, he's five hours ahead, but Mark Ollie, And he is just a dear friend and, you know, one of my archaeologist friends who's written many, many books. And tomorrow we're going to be talking about the Knights Templar. I mean, really digging deep and talking about the Knights Templar. There's so much information here that this, a lot of people just don't know. And he knows a lot. So it's one of my very near and dear topics. I know it is for Amelia and for many people because we get a lot of requests for Knights Templar stuff. So this is going to be one of those shows that's going to be filled with information. So I'm going to be joining you guys in the chat room tomorrow and you'll have to go over to, of course, uh, the Outer Realm. Um, like I won't be on Facebook, guys. You'll have to go to my personal, which is Michelle DeRoche at the Outer Realm Radio on YouTube. And the live link this should be up. If not, just go come right here to where you all are right now. And uh, I will be in that chat room to interact with you guys. It will be a lot of fun. So until then, guys, good night. Thank you for tuning in. You guys make it that much more fun. I'm really thrilled you enjoyed this the show and this segment. Thank you. And a nice easy listening. Yes, listening, relaxing. We love it. So we'll see you all tomorrow night in chat. Good night.